Good morning, and welcome to the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. I'm Todd Sexer, a professor in the politics department and a senior fellow here at the Miller Center. Let's begin our session today with a provocative and yet mostly uncontroversial observation, which is that most Americans don't know very much about international affairs. That's almost certainly not true of the good people in our audience today, but most Americans, regrettably, are not attending Miller Center events on a regular basis. The reality is that most Americans' understanding of global affairs is fairly limited. Last year, the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Geographic Society released a report from a large survey of American adults trying to find out what they know about the world. And the study uncovered two very important findings. The first finding was that Americans believe that knowledge of the world is important to have. A large majority in this survey, more than 95%, said that it was at least moderately important that international and foreign policy issues be taught in high school and college. Issues like alliances, diplomacy, trade, and terrorism. More than 95% said it was important. And most Americans also think it's important to know about international issues. 70% believe that events around the world affect their daily lives. So that's one finding from this study. But the second finding was that most people don't actually have very much knowledge about international issues. About three quarters of Americans reported in this survey that they learned not very much or nothing at all about foreign policy during their years in school. And indeed, when people in the survey were asked about basic international issues, they did not perform especially well. For example, only about half of respondents could identify Iraq or Iran on a map. Less than half of respondents were able to identify Afghanistan as the country that provided safe haven to Al Qaeda in the years prior to the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. And just one third could correctly identify the constitutional process for approving treaties in the United States. I'll say, save you the trip to Wikipedia the president signs the treaty and the Senate approves it with a two thirds majority. And in the survey as a whole, just one in 20 respondents answered 80% or more of the factual questions correctly. Just one in 20 scored what would be in my courses, a B minus or above, one in 20. If the last events or the events of the last nine months have taught us nothing else, it's that we live in a globalized and tightly interconnected world where a virus that originates in a wet market somewhere in China sweeps the world within weeks, causing widespread political and economic upheaval and the loss of more than a million lives. It has never been more important for Americans to understand the dynamics of the world around them, and yet by and large, they do not. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from one of the country's most prominent and most respected voices on foreign policy and international affairs, who has just written a book aimed at correcting this very problem. Dr. Richard Haas is in his 18th year as the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, an independent nonpartisan membership organization, think tank, publisher, and educational institution dedicated to being a resource to help people better understand the world and the foreign policy choices facing the United States and other countries. Dr. Haas has extensive government experience. From 1989 to 93, he was special assistant to President George H.W. Bush and senior director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. From 2001 to 2003, he was director of policy planning for the Department of State and was a principal advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell. Dr. Haas also served as U.S. coordinator for policy toward Afghanistan and U.S. envoy to the Northern Ireland peace process. And he's also the editor or, uh, or author of 14 books on American foreign policy, including the book that is the subject of today's discussion. It's called 
The World, A Brief Introduction, published by Penguin Press. Dr. Haas, welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thanks so much for having me and thank you for that generous and thoughtful introduction. Before we begin our discussion, let me first invite our audience to submit questions during the conversation uh, throughout the program. Just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we will get to as many questions as we can during the hour. Let's start, Dr. Haas, with the reasons that you wrote this book. It's fairly well known that global literacy among everyday Americans is, is low. We've known this for a long time, but it's also true that there are dozens of books, shelves of books out there that claim to give a basic introduction to the layperson about global affairs and foreign policy. So what, what did you see missing in this landscape that you wanted to correct? A few things. One is there are lots of books, but what I, try, what I wanted to do here, and I'll let others decide for themselves uh, whether I succeeded, was, was write something that was relatively short. There's 300 pages of text. It covered a lot of space. I didn't assume any background, so I did my best to avoid acronyms, jargon, uh, assumptions about knowledge of this or that event or this or that term. It was what the Brits would call a primer. We would call a primer. Don't ask me to explain the pronunciation difference. That is something I do not know, the origins of that. Uh, and I just didn't see anything else quite like it. So yes, there's any number of introductory books. A lot of the books that I expect many of you and many of your colleagues work are, are often heavy on theory in the introductory courses. I don't find that particularly valuable as someone uh, who's been working in these vineyards for uh, 40 years uh, and so forth. So I just basically wrote what I thought uh, an individual, whether it was a young person uh, in say high school or more likely college or graduate school or an average quote unquote average normal citizen uh, trying to make sense of the, uh, uh, the world. And what I wanted to do is do my uh, modest or immodest bit to try to narrow the gap between what I thought most people knew and understood and what I thought they needed to uh, uh, understand. The only thing I'd add to your introduction is, and I agreed with all of it, and again, thank you for it, is also that it's not something that people often don't understand the world or know a whole lot about it, but also they don't think it's terribly important. One of the things the exit poll showed in our recent election is just how few Americans, you know, over 100, what, over 150 million Americans voted. I don't think more than a handful voted on the basis of foreign policy and what the commander in chief might do or, or not do. If you watched all the debates in the town halls, these issues very barely figured. And yet, as you point out, here we are living with or dying with a virus that began in China. We just marked the 19th anniversary of 9-11. Climate change is having terrible effects with fires and floods and storms. Yet people don't seem to see the, the connection. So, so even if there are lots of other things out there, my own sense is for whatever reason, people aren't, uh, aren't connecting the dots. And I just say one other thing, and it, it motivates me a lot here. My, my, I think there's policy implications of all this. And push back at me if you disagree, and I'd actually love the conversation. But I think there's an inherent bias and isolationism in this. If people don't know about the world, if people don't care about the world, they don't hold their, their elected representatives to account. They don't ask them questions. I think it makes it much easier for the United States to slide into isolationism, to a basically, uh, to not particularly mind the world. And my own view is, uh, though there's often mistakes that, that grow from too much, if you will, involvement or the wrong kind of involvement in the world, I'm particularly worried about uh, a distancing from the world. So yes, I, I do have a, a general policy preference as well, which is the United States stays involved in the world, something that can probably best be sustained by the involvement and support of the, of the American people. Well, there's a, a lot there that I wanna talk about. Uh, let's start maybe with the causes of what we might call global illiteracy among Americans and, and the reasons that Americans seem to be so poorly informed uh, about foreign policy. A, a skeptic could say that 
Today, information about the world is just a click away. Everybody's got a cell phone. Uh, you're just a, a, a touch away from learning whatever it is you need to know about foreign policy. It's easier than ever to find information. And yet one of the interesting things about the survey that I just mentioned, which was commissioned by uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, of course, uh, is that the results of the survey to the extent uh, that there, uh, the, those questions had been asked in the past, uh, the results were mostly unchanged from the previous iteration of the survey, which was 30 years prior, uh, in the age before everybody had a cell phone or, or a laptop computer. So uh, Americans' knowledge seems not to be changing, even though information is more widely available. And so what, what's your sense of why Americans don't seek out information about foreign policy. You can hand them you know, a 300-page book about uh, international issues and regions of the world, um, but you can't force them to read it. How do you convince people that it's important to get that information? Well, since there's two different questions in there, which is, you're right, there's information that's a click away. Two things I'd say though, one is that requires a click uh, people have to be motivated enough to, to get it, which again may presume that it's a priority or they, they, they intuitively or otherwise understand why they should click, why it matters, why it does affect their, their lives. The other is if there's information that's a click away, there's also uh, disinformation that's a click away. And I don't know about your internet, but mine doesn't come with yellow post-it notes saying click on this, ignore that. So I think that's a problem. Think about also when uh, I'm, I'm a bit older than you, I expect when I grew up, you had all the morning television shows on the networks. Those used to cover international relations no longer. Uh, the nightly news barely covers it. Uh, foreign bureaus have been reduced around the, uh, the world. Uh, I'm not an expert on the University of Virginia, but if it's anything like most other schools, you offer all sorts of courses in this area, but you do not require as a condition of getting that piece of paper or piece of parchment that says you're a graduate of the school, that someone takes these courses. Uh, core curriculums are, are rare on, the, uh, on American campuses, but we tend to have a fairly generous, shall we say, distribution requirements. So you can graduate from you know, the Stanfords and Harvards and Yales. Again, I, I'm not an expert on UVA uh, without having availed yourself of these, of these uh, offerings of, the, of these uh, courses. So you know, for any number of reasons, uh, and by the way, it's not just this, uh, just today, there's been all sorts of stuff in the paper about the new civics exam, December 1, that's required of uh, would-be citizens. And I think the number of questions of my, I think it was 128, and you look at it, uh, but the same thing holds. I think most Americans would have trouble passing the exam we give to people who want to become citizens. And again, a lot of our schools either don't offer these courses or if they offer them, don't require them as a condition for graduation. This is true of high schools as well as uh, colleges. Again, uh, we've just gone through this experience in this country. And I think what we learned is that democracy, shall we say, is more vulnerable and fragile in some ways than we would have, uh, than, we, than, than, than we thought. One of the reasons I would argue is that civics and the DNA of our, of our American democracy is not as dispersed in the American bloodstream as it, as, it, as, it, as it should be. So yes, you're right. More information, more quality information, analysis is a click away, but that again, it requires people to click and also to be able to differentiate between what is good and what is not. And I would simply say it's not working. And I think it's a really interesting question. One, I'm struggling with, not just personally, but as the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, what can we do to better, get people better up to speed or educated, whatever you want to use, about our civics, about what's going on in the world, things that we would think are basics for being what Jefferson, uh, an individual known to your institution, uh, to, being, uh, to bringing about an informed citizenry. What is it we have to do better? And I think that's a, a really big and topical question. Let me ask you, uh, having done a little background reading uh, before this conversation about public opinion and foreign policy, uh, 
Uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the scholarship going back uh, literally decades that is more skeptical about the role of the US public in foreign policy. Uh, and, and some scholars have even worried that the American public uh, can never know enough about foreign policy issues that are esoteric and complex and highly technical, uh, and that the layperson is easily misled uh, that uh, it's just too difficult to learn what one needs to know uh, to make informed choices about foreign policy. Uh, and uh, I did some reading, uh, I'll, I'll read you a, a brief quotation here from a scholar named Walter Lippmann, uh, one of the prominent voices in, in US foreign policy in the 1950s. Uh, and here's what he wrote in 1955. He said, the prevailing public opinion has been destructively wrong at the critical junctures the people have imposed a veto upon the judgments of informed and responsible officials. They compel governments, which usually know what would be wiser or necessary or more expedient, to instead be too late with too little, too pacifist in peace and too bellicose in war. Mass opinion, he says, has shown itself to be a dangerous master of decisions when the stakes are life and death. So the, the question that I have for you is, you know, what's your reaction to some of these scholars like Lippmann uh, who argue that there are actually dangers in getting the public too involved uh, in foreign policy issues? There's so many things I could say. It's, it's, it takes one of back, back slightly to hear such a full-throated defense of elitism. <laughs> <laughs> it's so out of fashion. Uh, it is from 1955. It is 55. The, uh, look, that's true, by the way, I would think of what is, by that I mean, um, this lack of perhaps detailed knowledge, I'm not sure is unique to foreign policy, uh, way, how to deal with uh, money supply <laughs> or full employment, whatever. Uh, there's so many issues domestically. Uh, people may call for police reform, but exactly, but aren't aware of the mechanics of what hundreds of real world experiments and experiences have shown work that works or doesn't work. And that's why among other reasons, we, we don't have direct democracy for the most part. We don't run the country by plebiscites and referenda. We have a representative democracy. And the whole idea is that uh, people are pretty busy going about their lives and they provide directional uh, advice or support for, for power, those, those with power, but they entrust them up to a point to make the, the more detailed decisions. People, essentially, the deal in a democracy is those, those who have full-time jobs dealing with life, if you will, uh, entrust a small number with the full-time job of, of managing the, the affairs of the Republic. And that's true of things domestic as, as well as farm, but there's still, it's not a, uh, an unconditional grant of, of authority and power. It's, it's conditioned and it's limited with elections and. We also have things like courts and media. We have civil society uh, and checks and balances and uh, the like. So I'd say that. I also think that it puts a premium on public education. I don't mean classroom education, but the kind of publication, public education that leaders should do, but don't do nearly enough of. When I, I think if one looks, for example, at FDR's experience as president in trying to take a reluctant or even drag at times a reluctant public into a greater involvement in the affairs of the world that he, he understood why it was in our self-interest to do so, but the people weren't there yet. The fireside chats, I think are important or instructive uh, piece of, uh, of, uh, of, of governing that one can't just uh, assume that this will be, um, this will be, but I, I don't, Again, I don't, I don't think the answer is a kind of elitism. We don't, because among other things, the elites have made some awfully big mistakes. The decision to try to reunify all of Korea by force in 1950, one could argue a lot of Vietnam, one could argue the 2003 Iraq war, elements of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, these are hardly situations where elites crown themselves with glory, Mr. Littman notwithstanding. So you need public, because often the public may, may have more common sense 
about the relationship between ends and means than, than, than elites. So I don't think anyone's got a, a monopoly on, on wisdom uh, here. And that's why we, we, that's why we discuss and ultimately decide these matters in, in the public thing. I'd say one other thing from having served in government a lot. What you, what you learn on the inside or what you learn for is often a level of detail, but the first order stuff, you don't have to devote 26 hours a day to, to you don't have to do essentially, you don't have to make the career choice that you've made. Uh, not that I'm discouraging it, I admire it and respect it, but one doesn't have to do that to have essentially intelligent views about, about these, uh, these issues. And I'd even say often with the so-called experts, all the pressures or many of the pressures in the world you occupy or I occupy are so are to make one so specialized, so granular. I'm not sure that necessarily translates into wisdom on most uh, public policy uh, issues. Uh, if I ever won a tenure, I guess I've just blown my chances for it somewhere. But uh, so anyhow, I, uh, I, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Littman, who's one of the, you know, one of the great minds who's ever put pen to paper on these issues, I, I, I don't disparage the public and I don't necessarily embrace the elites to the extent that that, that quote suggests. What about the policy implications of the lack of public knowledge or engagement with international affairs? You alluded earlier, and, and in fact, you discuss in your book uh, that you think a a public that uh, is disengaged with international affairs is more easily misled and specifically more easily uh, persuaded by isolationist arguments. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe give us an example of where you see uh, a lack of public engagement allowing or supporting a, a particular policy direction that, that you think is unwise? Look, I mean, take a step back. You know, we've been in business as a country for nearly two and a half centuries. Uh, but two thirds of that time or more, our involvement in the world, shall we say, has been minimal. So I think that is in some ways the natural default option. It changed with World War II and it's continued up pretty much to the present. And I think the really interesting question out there is whether the last four, in some ways, four plus years have been something of the aberration or whether the previous 75 years are something of the uh, 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 an aberration. I also think a, a public that isn't particularly involved, it's not necessarily that they yank us out of things, but they give a leader who wants to pull us back tremendous leeway to do so. So when the lack of public involvement in these issues gave Mr. Trump tremendous latitude uh, to pull the United States out of all sorts of arrangements to talk about troop withdrawals to threaten American allies, because there was very little pushback. Uh, again, it also reflects something about the way foreign policy is made and, and, and implemented. The, there's a real bias towards the, the executive, but there was a lack of constraint. So, you know, I think the last time that, um, you know, international um, domestic pressure, I have to think about it, but you had the, the pre-World War II experience, American reluctance to, 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 to get involved. It took the Japanese uh, attack on Pearl Harbor to fundamentally uh, change it. I thought it was interesting, you know, if one goes back to the early Cold War days, the, the pressure or the, the push to get the American pe people to support a large peacetime role in the world. And then I think that continued with a kind of inertia for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And I think what's interesting and largely because of the financial crisis of 2007, eight problems here at home, and then the, the overreach of Iraq and Afghanistan, I think all that essentially was undone. And that is where, and I, and I actually think, to me, the danger now going forward is, is perhaps more underreach than overreach. I think we've gone, uh, full cycle there. I, I thought Iraq and Afghanistan represented forms of overreach, this kind of transformational hubris that's so affected or infected American foreign policy. And I think, you know, to the extent that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now we have the reaction of, 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 of underreach. We saw it with Obama. We certainly saw it in spades with, uh, with, with Trump. 
And I think the question is, you know, how do you right size or rebalance kind of American farm policy in terms of our ambitions, in terms of our commitments? I think that's the challenge for Mr. Biden and his uh, and ultimately for his his success, his successors. Uh, but I think right now, probably given all the you know, if one looks at his domestic inheritance, I would think right now the bigger challenge facing American foreign policy is more the historic one, which is probably underreach rather than the dangers of, uh, of overreach. Let's talk a little bit about the political landscape of American foreign policy. And this is not unrelated to this question of public engagement, because at the same time that the American public is at least partially disengaged from foreign policy issues, uh, it is heavily engaged in politics. Uh, and of course, very deeply polarized, maybe more than ever. How does the degree of partisanship and polarization among the American public seep into foreign policy making? And sort of as a follow up to that, do you see any prospects for trying to fix that, uh, even if the broader problem of polarization can't be corrected? My initial reaction is not as much as some might think. One is for a reason I already alluded to, under our system and from the constitution on, but also our traditions, the executive branch, the president enjoys tremendous leeway when it comes to the conduct of foreign policy. So even granted that the country is divided and polarized in many ways, he still enjoys tremendous leeway. Second of all, a lot of the polarization and, and the rest is not particularly premised on foreign policy. Uh, I mean, it was, I remember say during Vietnam, so much it was, I, I don't feel that now. These are not the issues I think that are defining uh, American politics and indeed elements of the left and right uh, might agree that we're quote unquote doing too much in the world and not enough at home. They might disagree on what we should be doing uh, uh, at, uh, at home. But I, I don't think there's, you know, something more, um, again, a, a, a partisan, but, and I, one, the only other thing I'd say, what's interesting to me, and it's actually a rare note of optimism. You, know, you don't hear a lot of them from me, I, I grant that, uh, is I do think there's some potential for bipartisanship out there. I think there is a, pro, a bipartisan or cross-partisan skepticism and wariness now of China that didn't exist. I think there is a cross-partisan or bipartisan uh, pushback against authoritarian uh, regimes around the uh, around the world. I think here I'm less enthusiastic. There's something about a, a bipartisan uh, wariness at times of trade agreements. I think uh, that is there. There may be bipartisan support for uh, increasing the resilience and diversity of supply chains. There's been bipartisan support about a closer relationship with India and the. Uh, between the United States and India. So I, I could go around, but uh, again, uh, I think there are areas of significant bipartisanship in, 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 in foreign policy. And so I, I just don't see it right now as, as the kind of at times poisonous or let's just a more neutral word, polarized nature of our domestic politics. I don't see it quite as much in, in the foreign policy domain. I'm, and I'd be curious whether you disagree with that. Maybe I'm overlooking something, but all things being equal, there are, there are robust debates. But I don't feel they're, they're quite as uh, reflexive or quite as uh, fixed. So I, I think the natural follow-up question is, is there a risk then of getting the public too engaged in these issues in that if they become, <laughs> the public become more engaged, then maybe it becomes more polarized and we see the kind of stasis and gridlock uh, at a partisan level that we see in domestic policy, then maybe seeping into foreign policy? Or do you think the international dynamics of the rise of China and transnational problems like climate change will, will overcome that problem? Well, I gotta tell you, there's a lot that worries me and a lot that keeps me up at night. That is not high on my list. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also don't think the history of American popular involvement in foreign policy issues has to be all that divisive. I mean, a lot of it has to do with basic matters of war and peace. But if you look at the Pew polls and other polls and the Chicago Council polls over the years, 
there actually is a certain general bias or leaning a preponderance of views towards internationalism. Again, it's not at a level of detail that it would have clear policy implications, but there, there is support for trade, there is support for alliances, there is support for democracy. So I think the kind of leaning of the American public is quite consistent with a multilateralist, internationalist United States. Now, after that, obviously things divide up or break down when you start getting into really granular matters of uh, policy. But I don't think that's gonna, un unless it raise, gets raised up to a level like Iraq, uh, or um, Vietnam. My own experience, again, is popular involvement. And you've done you know, work at places like you know, the Miller Center and other places where unless the costs of the policy are really immediate, and particularly in terms of human cost, my own hunch, again, is popular involvement doesn't really force or preclude certain foreign policy initiatives. Uh, in your book, you begin with a broad historical overview of the international system uh, to summarize in, in just a couple of words, starting with the Thirty Years' War all the way up through the end of the Cold War and, and the post-Cold War period. Um, so that, that suggests to me that you see knowledge of international history as number one, being important, and number two, lacking uh, among sort of the average American. It, yeah. you know, in your experience in government with the Council on Foreign Relations, is, is there a particular historical period or a historical issue uh, or event where you find yourself surprised by the lack of understanding or lack of knowledge uh, among the general public that, that you're trying to correct? I'll get to that, but let me just sort of say your general point, absolutely. Uh, and it reflects my own biases. One is, uh, and I didn't study a whole lot of history in college, I studied some, but when I got to Oxford and did my graduate work there, there was a real bias towards diplomatic history as opposed to more contemporary social science or theory. And that, that had a real impact on me. And then when I taught at the, the Kennedy School, uh, two of my closest colleagues were Dick Neustadt and Ernie May. And one semester, Ernie May was on leave and Dick Neustadt said, asked me if I would co-teach the uses of history course with him, which was a real treat because uh, Dick Neustadt was a, a prince. Uh, and they were just reinforced my sense about policy, the, the value of policy relevant history and this question of trying to use history to inform decision and books like Thinking in Time that Newstead and May did, I find invaluable. Uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, we've added a whole history dimension to our, our work uh, in terms of historians and residents and uh, meeting series. Uh, our educational products have a historical dimension. I just find it really useful. I find it from more, when people ask me, I get asked all the time, as I expect you do. What should I study if I want to get involved in this field? And I said, look, this is, you could study geographies, countries, uh, functional things like economics. Or, but if you ask me, if I, if I could choose one thing, I would say history. I find that the, the best provider of framing and uh, perspective. I think now, I think, the, again, as I, consistent with what I said a few minutes ago, if you're, if you're most worried about underreach, and a lack of American in, in involvement in the world. Uh, and you're, that leads you to either thinking about pre-World War I or you know, pre-World War II periods in terms of uh, challenges in the United States, not seeing enough connectedness between those challenges and its own self-interest. I think when you look at China, there's obviously questions more, I think, of pre-World War I. The other thing I'd say though, and it shows some of the limits of history, is what in many ways differentiates this moment in time is the significance of global issues. We're obviously focused on health, but climate, uh, proliferation, uh, the lack of regulation in, in, in cyberspace and so forth. And I don't think there is a good historical analog to that. Indeed, it's this combination of the traditional stuff of great power rivalry and geopolitics, which is the stuff of history, 
And then the newfangled stuff, which is the, these global issues for which responses have been inadequate. Uh, there really isn't much of a historical guide there. And that's what makes this period of history, I would argue, uh, different. And the utility of history is in some ways limited as a result. I think it's more in, instructive on the thinking about geopolitics, matters of war and peace, rising powers and balances of power, peacemaking, that whole set of issues. I think history is, is really valuable uh, for, I think on how to come together you know, to, to put another way, to make the phrase international community a reality rather than aspirational. I don't think there's as, as, as much guidance there uh, as, as, as there might be. Yeah, this question of learning from history, I, I think is a very important and very timely one. And of course, uh, your experience working with uh, Ernie May and Richard Neustadt, uh, May especially having written you know, a great deal about how leaders learn or don't learn lessons of history. And we see examples of both. Uh, there's also some work on overlearning or learning the wrong lessons from history. Uh, and of course the you know, prime examples are Korea and Vietnam, you know, leaders that learn the lesson that appeasement doesn't work and compromise doesn't work from the 1930s thought that they were applying the right lessons in 1960s and 70s with Vietnam. Uh, it, you know, maybe you can speak from your experience in government or uh, just in, in thinking about these issues. How, how do you strike that balance between making sure leaders have the right information and historical background without you know, making, while also making sure they don't blindly apply what they think are the lessons of history to cases that aren't applicable or aren't, aren't uh, analogous? It's a great question and you're 100% right. And the question is how to use history rather than abuse it, apply it and all that. I mean, the British went through a painful experience in the 50s when their leadership uh, saw, thought they faced a new Hitler-like challenge with Nasser. And, th and then you had the entire disaster of Suez. And it shows the, the danger in, in misreading, if you will, contemporary events and, and, and all that. There's also value, by the way, and I'll answer your question this way, which is uh, when I worked for President Bush, the father, and during Operation Desert Storm, we were doing extraordinarily well, as you recall, and we had the six, seven weeks of air campaign. We then had a several days of a ground campaign. And the question was, where do you stop or do you keep going? And do you go to Baghdad? And I wrote a memo for the president and I talked about the Truman MacArthur decision after the liberation of South Korea following the Incheon landing and the decision to go to try to reunify the peninsula by force. Mm -hmm. And I talked what I thought was history's lesson. I wrote about this, about expanding your war aims in the flush of tactical uh, success and the danger in doing that. And I thought, you know, that was, I felt pretty good about it. President agreed, Brent Scowcroft agreed. And when you look back a, dec in a decade on when the United States did get ambitious in Iraq, uh, it didn't work out so well, the last I checked. And the lesson I take from that is it's fine to apply history or not, but make sure you really understand local knowledge. That history gives you broad, suggestions, broad strokes, but then really drill down. And, you know, I wrote in one of my other books, and it was a bit edgy or tongue in cheek or whatever phrase you want to use, that before we uh, go to war with the country, we ought to understand it. And uh, I think that wasn't the case in Vietnam and it wasn't the case in Iraq. And I just think that's, that's such a, so if you are going to apply history, I just think, uh, that you ought to really be sure, and actually New Staten may write about this in Thinking in Time, about that what you're, what's, what's, what is parallel, but then be just as rigorous about what's not parallel, what is different, because no two situations are exactly alike. And you know, again, the whole idea that it rhymes, uh, so it's not identical. So just be as aware of what differentiates what it is you're contending with, as opposed to what parallels, and then really ask yourself, given those both what the parallels as well as the differences, what's too much history, if you will, 
to, to just, just be rigorous. And my own view is too many people tend to, they have a kind of a bias. They tend to prefer those histories or those elements of history that seem to support their own preferences. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, which is another, so to guard, that's where things like red teaming come in and bring other people into the, the conversation just to guard against it. So I think there are things you can do in terms of using history. There's almost slightly, um, there's like a toolkit uh, about how to, how to try to get the most out of it without falling prey to, you know, as someone once said, not every compromise is another Munich. Uh, even Churchill said appeasement can be the right policy. And knowing when it is and when it isn't, that, that's, when it get, that's when it gets interesting. Yeah, that's great stuff. Um, I, I want to make sure we have a moment uh, to get to some questions from our audience. Uh, and the first question here that I want to draw your attention to has to do with this issue about engagement versus restraint in foreign policy. And this is a topic that we've been talking about here at the Miller Center for a while. We had a debate uh, about uh, six, seven weeks ago between Anne-Marie Slaughter and Steve Walt uh, about this question of engagement and restraint. Uh, and for those in the audience that uh, can be viewed on the Miller Center website, that debate. Uh, but here we have a, an audience member, uh, her name is Tandy Munson, and she asks the question, how can the US be involved in the world without bankrolling all the world's needs? I think that's the issue that some citizens have become weary of hearing that the US is always paying most of the funding rather than other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I pose that question to you. How, how do you sure. balance involvement uh, with uh, the, the question of burden sharing, which you wrote about a little bit in your yeah. book? First of all, I'm not wild about phrases like engagement and restraint. Uh, engagement on behalf of what? What are your goals? There's a big difference between goals that are, shall we say, wildly ambitious and goals that are quite modest. That to me is where foreign policy gets interesting. It's not this switch between engagement or disengagement. And then there's the question of means. What tools do you use? Then there's the question of what do you do alone or with others? So I find it impossible to debate engagement versus strategy. One of the words I, I, I almost ban, I, I have a whole list of my least favorite phrases in the field. I did an article on it. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna do a, a follow-up article. My list keeps growing. One of them is engagement, because uh, I don't know what it means. And it can be good or bad, depending upon the, the content uh, of it. And you've also got to compare it, like compared to what? There's a, I mean, by and large, and I think it's useful to point out that most people are, when they critique they critique proposals. They tend to miss one, which is the proposal of either sticking with what you've got or not doing anything. And we've gotta be just as mindful and just as critical uh, of inaction as we have to be of action. I'm not, it's not a bias to act. I, I just want it to be considered with equal intellectual uh, rigor. This question of bankrolling again, you know, first of all, what we spend on defense just to take one measure of national security, it's upwards of what, 750 billion plus or minus uh, big bucks for sure. But as a percentage of GDP, it's far below the Cold War average. So I'd simply say that for one. So in and of itself, spending a lot now in absolute terms, in relative terms is, 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 is I don't know, what, 50, 60% only of what we averaged during the Cold War. Second of all, I've yet to meet the public policy question where how much you spend is the most important thing. It's always how you spend it. Uh, it's true of healthcare. We spend a lot on healthcare in this country long before COVID. Uh, we, we nearly, what, double the OECD average. Last I checked, we don't have outcomes that are twice as good. How you spend it is uh, education. Again, how you spend the money. Uh, and, and so I, I, I tend not to get hung up as much. Europeans spend, what, $300 billion a year on defense? The problem is we don't get $300 billion a year of defense out of it. They could spend less on defense and have more actual defense capability if they better integrated their decision-making and their allocation of euros, but they don't. But so to bang them over the head as, the as this administration has done over how much they spend, is the wrong uh, focus. So 
So to me, the question is not bankrolling. The question is, who are we bankrolling and what are we bankrolling them to do? It's what are the, if we save a dollar, are we better off? So I, I don't focus, if you will, on, you know, the answer is we could spend a lot more than we're spending and not bankrupt ourselves. We could spend less than we're spending and probably have more to show for it. If we made, if we made better, uh, if we made better choices at home and, and so I would keep the focus there rather than simply on uh, the quote unquote costs of America's involvement in, in the world. Well, g- give us some examples. What, where do you think are the best opportunities for you know, the United States to spend less but get more or you know, spend money smarter uh, or in a, in a wiser way uh, even while spending less so that the, the U.S. foreign policy can be more efficient or more effective. Sure. Okay, well, look, um, uh, one, I just talked about NATO. I think if there was greater integration in NATO procurement decisions, I think that would, I mean, the problem is you have two, you, essentially NATO works way too much by national decision-making. Uh, that would be, one. I, I'd probably want to look at some other alliances the same way whether we're doing enough to uh, integrate our, our decision, decision making and allocation decision. I think defense, which is the single biggest pot of money, uh, way too many big ticket items. I'm not a defense specialist, but I find it you know, hard to believe, you know, when I look at what individual aircraft and so forth costs now, I think the, this question of um, quantity versus quality and whether the last 5% of quality is worth only having half the quantity, I, I doubt. So my hunch is we have way too many big high ticket weapon systems, including carriers and so forth that just don't make sense. But the inertia of military decision-making uh, and preferences within the services seems to me, again, we could have much more defense for less, I would think if we, if we got it uh, Got right. Other aspects of national security don't cost a lot. If you look at everything with diplomacy, I want to spend more. I'm not looking for savings. I actually think we uh, training in the State Department. I'd love to spend more on that. Uh, investing in people seems to me a smart thing to uh, to do. Uh, aid, foreign aid accounts are again are negligible. They're, they're, I'd rather spend more money. Um, uh, spend more more money there. So uh, intelligence. I think it's hard to save money because we have so many potential targets now we have to cover. We don't have a, the, the ability to, to focus the same way we did during the Cold War. So I would say you know, the biggest area for probably some savings is defense, but only if you could do it intelligently. Otherwise, I might actually look to expand some of our, our, our spending on, uh, on the national security, particularly in the area of diplomacy. Well, let's talk a, l- a little bit about the incoming Biden administration. Uh, And and going back a little bit to your book, uh, you know, one of the apparent features of, uh, you know, many of the people in Biden's national security team is that they have experience, extensive experience uh, in government having served under Obama uh, as well. Uh, But what should this incoming team know uh, what do you hope that they will know about the landscape that the U.S. is embedded in right now? What, what, what do you want them to, to know about the world that they're facing? One is I do think the, the, the issue with the most urgency is COVID related. That until we get that better managed, I just don't think as a society, as an economy, as a country, we'll have the bandwidth to do a lot else. So you know, in re- real estate, you say there's, you know, location, location, location. I think in the short run, it's a little bit of COVID, COVID, COVID. A lot of it's domestic testing and uh, therapeutics as well as vaccine rollout distribution. Internationally, uh, again, vaccine distribution. I think the question of reform of the WHO is a that can wait a little bit, though ultimately it's, 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 you know, I wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs Magazine, it's a journal you may have heard of, uh, that uh, we published that. I said, there's a difference between um, repairing and rebuilding. And I said, uh, 
the repair is the immediate stuff. And I thought that was COVID alliances and uh, get back into some agreements. Then that's a six to nine month thing. And then after that, there's, there's all the more institution reform, institution building uh, and so forth. I, uh, dealing with you know, establishing a real conversation, a real dialogue with, with China and so forth. I, so I, I think there is a difference between the immediate repair stuff and then the, the longer term. I would say though, as a framing thing, um, which is what you were getting at, I'd say three things. One is to try to, if we can, structure great power rivalry and competition, different kinds of challenges fundamentally coming from Russia and China, but to try to structure them so they don't get out of hand. I think that's doable. We have playbooks for doing that. I, as I said, secondly, this idea of trying to narrow the gap between global challenges and global responses, that's a big thing. And that could be defining for this era. The administration has made climate its priority. That is one of several, I would say. There is health, there is proliferation, uh, there's cyberspace and so forth, but dealing with all of those. And then domestically, gets back to kind of where you and I began the conversation. How do we get a better job, do a better job of gaining public support for America's involvement in the world? Again, uh, getting adequate support so we avoid a kind of massive turning inward and uh, a kind of isolationist uh, phase in American foreign policy where we, we overreact, if you will, to, over, to overreach. And so I would spend a little bit of time uh, doing that. And I think the hardest thing out of all of it is going to be this is thinking about how do we kind of, how do we innovate? Where do we create? Because the answer is not just to get back into the World Health Organization or back into the Paris Accords. It's how do we build 21st century institutions and arrangements? And I would just say, here we are, what, we're just over three decades since the end of the Cold War. And I don't think we have a lot to show for this era. My own view is, I mean, um, you said early on, I can't remember, it was a B minus or whatever grade you would give. I'd probably give a lower grade to the United States. When you look at where we emerged three decades ago in terms of absolute and relative power, looking at the world and what we now have to show for it, I actually think it has been a really disappointing era of American performance in the world. This is not a partisan comment because we've had Republican and Democratic administrations over this time. But I would just say we have very little to show for three decades of American primacy and that we frittered away in many ways. And so the question is, okay, how do we do better over the next three decades? That to me is the real question. What do you think would be a good model then for thinking about the next several decades? I mean, do we go back to 1945 and and, and begin to rebuild or recreate international institutions and alliances? Uh, or, or is it a different approach that, that you think would be necessary? I do think in some ways that period is the, the best analog for all of its differences, but yes, it's the most creative, innovative era of American foreign policy. And we had two sets of things going on. We had the stuff of geopolitics, if you will, dealing with the Soviet Union, the Cold War competition, that order, deterrence and so forth. And then we had the larger effort, which the Soviets did not participate in, or what you know, a lot of people call the liberal world or liberal democratic order, but building these global institutions uh, and, and so forth. And understanding that to some extent it was motivated about reducing vulnerabilities to communism and so forth. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think now the question is how do we modernize partnerships and alliances for dealing with geopolitical challenges? But at the same time, how do we build arrangements which go beyond them? Or to put it bluntly, it's one of the reasons I'm against the China-centered foreign policy. We could succeed vis-a-vis -vis China. We could hold our own in the South China Sea. We could hold our own vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and so forth. Yet, overall security in the world could uh, be undermined with, through things like climate change, through global health, through proliferation, through terrorism, and, and so forth. So to me, a structured relationship with China is necessary, but not sufficient. I do not believe it can provide the kind of uh, intellectual organizational force 
So uh, uh, some new version of a containment-like strategy to me is, is, is the wrong way to think about it. So when I talk about the 40s, I, I, I do so carefully. Uh, the, I think we need mechanisms for dealing with China, which is a qualitatively different kind of challenge than is Russia or was the Soviet Union. But I also think we need to have a whole different set of uh, framing and ultimately arrangements for dealing with global challenges. And I even think at the, at the risk of getting wonky here, uh, but we're better than an academic institution. Uh, the, that we, we, we also re, really re, need to rethink some of the idea of sovereignty that have informed international relations for, for centuries now, where I began the book you mentioned with the 30 years war and this notion of sovereignty as build, being the building block of what international order there has been. That's true, but my own view is again, to use that phrase, it is necessary, but not sufficient. We need to rethink sovereignty for a global world in which what goes on inside countries' borders can no longer be hands off. If what goes on inside countries' borders constitutes real threats to the rest of us, we're experiencing it because of China's mishandling of a virus. We're experiencing it because of Brazil's irresponsibility on the Amazon rainforest. We experienced it 19 years ago because of Afghanistan's willingness to allow terrorists to use its territory. What we've got to think about in the 21st century is how do we adapt? How do we evolve our thinking about sovereignty? So we, we keep the best parts of it, but we actually broaden it to deal with the fact of globalization and what goes on inside borders can't simply be the province of the country that operates those borders. We do not have a system for dealing with that, that reality and we're paying an enormous price for it. Well, going back to this, this question of the late 1940s as a model for the United States thinking about the next several decades and especially its relationship with China, one of the features of the Cold War is that the US and the Soviets didn't do a great job cooperating to deal with transnational or global issues, nuclear proliferation maybe being an exception. Uh, and if the COVID crisis demonstrates nothing, it's that transnational issues are, are incredibly important and that collaborating on those issues will be critical to trying to deal with them, not just global health, but as you say, climate change and uh, many other issues. Can the United States and China do a better job of working together, do you think, than the US and the Soviets did? And, and what has to be done here as we wrap up our conversation, what, yeah. what should the US be thinking about in, in terms of trying to reach that level, level of cooperation? Um, it's a really good question. The answer is we, we can and we have to. Uh, the reason we have to, it's a very different 21st century if the United States and China can't cooperate on regional and global issues, whether it's Korea, North Korean proliferation or climate change or, or global health or what have you. It's, it's a much, much worse century. If the, United, if the United States and China have a relationship that precludes limited or selective cooperation. So that seems to me the foreign policy challenge. How do you push back against China where it's warranted, whether it's over the South China Sea, Taiwan, human rights, whatever. But how do you do so in a way that doesn't preclude the cooperation where it's in our self-interest to, to cooperate? Now, that's why, you know, one might say that's why God invented diplomats. Uh, that's why uh, statecraft is a, is a craft. Uh, and and it, it, it's, it's, it's challenging. I do think it's possible though, in part because the United States and China for all of our differences, I don't think are as fundamentally opposed as the United States and the Soviet Union were. Plus China does want involvement in the world. It wants many of the benefits that come with involvement. So China to me is not a revolutionary uh, power to use kind of the old Kissingerian uh, framework. It's a rising power, but not a revolutionary one, I would argue. And so, and, it, and the purpose, what we want to do, and that's where I so disagreed with the current Secretary of State, you know, we shouldn't be spending our time railing on against the Communist Party and calling for regime change in China. That's a fool's errand. Uh, that's folly. What we should be focusing on is how do we shape China's behavior? How do we shape China's choices? That's the stuff of foreign policy. That's the stuff of statecraft. That's the stuff of diplomacy. 
I believe in that. And is it going to be easy? Of course not. Given the domestic pressures on both sides, given the very real differences in our systems and in our objectives and our interests, but there is some overlap. There is some overlap in what either we want or what we want to avoid. China, for example, does not want indiscriminate proliferation in Northeast Asia. That would be a strategic nightmare for them. So it has reasons to play uh, up to a point a constructive role. China doesn't want to have a trade war with the rest of the world. It doesn't want, it doesn't want a war in Northeast Asia that would preclude its economic uh, interactions to, 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 to go for it. So I actually think we have ways of influencing what China does. Transform, transforming China, no. Influencing, yes. But influencing is the stuff of foreign policy. So I actually think it's a time to go back to that. And, and by the way, the policy, that was the policy towards the Soviet Union. Kennan's containment was a policy of influencing. The fact that four decades later, the Soviet Union blew up, that was kind of a bonus. And he hinted at it, that that could happen. Their own, their own frustrations could lead to that. But, the, we, but we rejected rollback in the case of the Soviet Union. And our policy was to shape Soviet behavior and it, and it worked. It worked really well and we kept the peace. So that, to me, we have a model for this with, with China and it's both more difficult but also less difficult because China is an economic power unlike the Soviet Union. So I've, uh, I actually think there are things we can and should uh, do with China that, that again, it's, it's not a problem to be solved but it's a challenge and a situation to be managed. And I do think that that's within, within it's, it's not naive to think that's possible. Well, Dr. Haas, uh, provocative and informative as always. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, Dr. Richard Haas, author of The World, A Brief Introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining us at the Miller Center and we will see you all next time. Thanks so much.